Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, August 27th. Today our session topic is the space, a guide for educators, which is also the title of a book that our special guests wrote, uh, Dr. Robert Dillon and Rebecca Hare. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who's going to introduce our guests and ask them the newbie question. Well, thank you, Lori, and welcome to all of you. The EdTech team has a lot of amazing educators that provide webinars and all kinds of resources for teachers. And today, we are very fortunate to have two of their educational team joining us to share some of their great tips and information about designing learning spaces both with and for students. So we're excited to have Rebecca Hare and Dr. Robert Dillon, who signed in as Bob Dillon, joining us. And they are co-authors of this book on learning space design called The Space. Rebecca is currently a design specialist and science teacher with Gulliver Schools in Miami, Florida, and obviously a learning space designer. She has a BFA in industrial design from the European Design Institute in Milan, Italy, and an MAT in art from Fontbonne University in St. Louis. She worked in Italy for 10 years as a design consultant and creative director, creating spaces and designing products from MRI machines and coffee makers to hairbrushes for global companies before she became fascinated with education. She found that the young designers she was hiring were struggling with solving problems and thinking critically. So this brought her back to the United States to study education. And she did her master's thesis on design thinking, evaluating, and enhancing creativity through the study of design and art. Do you see why we're so excited to have her with us? She's collaborated with lots of schools on design thinking and creating um, effective learning environments, and she'll be sharing some of that with us today. Rebecca, her husband, and two children can be found at the beach early on weekends in the pool if they can't make it to the beach, and if it's summer, visiting family in Italy. Dr. Robert Dillon has served as an educational leader in a number of public schools all throughout the St. Louis area over the last 20 years as a teacher, a principal, and a director of innovation. He has this passion to change the educational landscape by building excellent, engaging schools for all students. And you're going to hear how he goes about doing that in this session today. He serves in the leadership team for Connected Learning, which is a St. Louis-based organization that's designed to reshape professional development to meet today's needs. He speaks around the country at local, state, and national conferences and has published in many places. He's actually the author of four books on best practices in learning, Leading Connected Classrooms, Engage, Empower, and Energizing, Leading Tomorrow Schools Today, Redesigning Learning Space, and the one we're going to hear something about today, The Space, A Guide for Educators. So we want to welcome both of you. and ask you to answer our newbie question and just jump right into your presentation and talk to us about what it means to you when you use the term learning space designer. Good morning, and uh, thanks to everyone who makes this happen. I was just amazed. I've been on a few of these as a participant, and uh, it's so nice to be on the other side today and have folks from all around the world uh, here and joining us for the next 40 minutes or so. Hi, I'm Rebecca. So this is, this is great. This is actually my very first um, Blackboard 
and Classroom 2.0 Live, so I'm really excited. Um, I, I'll answer the question first, Bob, if you're okay. Sounds good. Uh, <laughs> what does it mean to be a learning space designer? Uh, something that we talk about and one of the reasons that we wrote the book is that you, if you are in a classroom or in a school, you probably already are a learning space designer, whether or not you intend to be or you're conscious of it. And every decision that you make will affect your students and the design of a classroom and how they learn and how comfortable they feel and how they feel empowered. So I think everybody is that's in a classroom and hopefully also our students are learning space designers. Yeah, and in a simple way, uh, every time you turn the lights on in your classroom, every time you leave the door open, every time you change the blinds, every time you turn the temperature up and down, those are all uh, learning space design decisions. Uh, those aren't the ones we're going to stress today, but those are absolutely um, decisions that you're making every day that are infecting, uh, and impacting the learning environment. So uh, that's what it means uh, to be that learning space designer. So uh, let's jump to here. Um, Rebecca, thoughts here? So we, when thinking about talking about and introducing the concepts behind empowering educators to think about changing their learning spaces, one of the things that happened when Bob and I um, had, the, had the great opportunity to work together with Afton School District in St. Louis, Missouri, was that we were really budget restricted and we really thought about how we could reutilize spaces and re-energize them. And we created, this is a beta space that um, we created, which was used to be an old computer lab. Uh, it's a pity we didn't put a before picture on this, but I think that's shared in some of our links. And um, I think Bob knows exactly how much this space cost to, to change and energize, but the purpose behind it was to create a design space, a space for students to create, and a space for teachers to bring their students in to experience school in a completely different way. Yeah, I think one of the things that we really want to stress here as we walk through this is this isn't about, hey, someone just dropped off a $50,000 check, because uh, most of us as educators are never going to have that happen. We're never going to be at a point in time where folks are just uh, handing out money to redesign learning spaces. But really so much of what we talk about are subtle ways and thoughtful, intentional ways to make changes to the space. And this space uh, really was more about eliminating uh, 35 computers from a computer lab and purchasing about $2,500 worth of um, furniture and a whole bunch of different things that you'll see as we go along. I think uh, one of our focuses as we talk about this, though, is we know deeply that the research tells us that we can do things to impact uh, student learning and make our classrooms more brain friendly. I think that that's always been our focus, and you know, Rebecca brings a great wealth of experience uh, as a designer to the table. And you know, my passion's always been about getting kids supercharged, excited about their learning. And I know that some of our classrooms, lots of our classrooms, aren't currently doing that. So I have a deep sense of urgency about this brain-friendly classroom idea. We went too far. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> so, and, and with that, I think what we really mean, um, it was funny because I was speaking with another educator the other day, and she was talking about how we can get our students engaged. And I think really with about having brain-friendly classes, we're really focusing instead of just engaging our students to really empower them, empower them to be a part of the learning, to know what works best for them. And uh, I overuse the word uh, metacognition, but I think when you are talking to your students about which spaces support different kinds of learning and having them understand what kind of a learner they are or what they need to do to learn different things and how they learn, unlearn, and relearn information and technology and ideas, that, that they have the power in their hands to do that. Because ultimately, they're going to walk out every day and at the end of their time with us, to, and they're going to engage the world and continue to learn. So we have to, our biggest goal as, um, as an educator is to empower them to understand how they learn and make them, start them on that path to be a lifelong learner. Yeah, and you know, you go to a lot of elementary classrooms, you see a lot of elements that are really good. But by the time we squeeze the life out of learning at secondary level, we really see this brain-friendly classroom idea just get thrown to the wayside. One of the other trends we see is this, is that um, and, you know, if you go on Google right now and search for learning spaces, you're going to see a lot of what we call 
Pinterest pretty classrooms uh, where a teacher found a whole bunch of great ideas on Pinterest and threw them up everywhere in their room. Uh, most of them weren't intentional about learning. Most of them were to make things cute. And what we try to talk about isn't about cute classrooms or neat bulletin boards or really, really cool ways to put kids' names on their desks, but really ways to empower deeper learning. And I think that's been our focus from the very beginning of when we started to write this book. You know, you see pictures like this of classrooms where people are like, oh, we had these great crates and we turned them over and we painted this table. And you start to ask questions about why. And a lot of times because we saw it on Pinterest, because our neighbor did it, because, I don't know, we felt like if we threw all the elements in the same room that something productive would happen. But in reality, it just doesn't work that way. Um, you know, Rebecca can talk a little bit more about some of the other trends she's seen around this as well. So, um, what I think is there's that trend of kind of over decorating, and um, which again, I, I always really stress like less is more. We need our white visual spaces, we need um, space to think. And they're putting everything up around the classroom actually makes you see nothing. So, being very intentional with what we're displaying. I create learning walls, usually like that the students, it's whatever the students are working on and it's changing. If it's, if it's up for more than two weeks and it hasn't changed, then probably it's become static and, you know, needs to be revised. A blank space in, in a classroom really isn't a negative. And I think that we kind of, we have this expectation as educators, like anything that still any, any space in our room needs to be covered. So this is a great example. This is um, the Wilson School in St. Louis, Missouri, and they have this, it's a very beautiful, very simple classroom. Now, here again, they spent, you know, obviously a good deal of money. They have brand new furniture. These um, are, these are, these are flexible desks and chairs they can move around. They have chosen a color palette that's limited and is, re is respected in their artwork, but it's an engaging, inviting environment. So you can do this for much less. You don't have to have new furniture to clear out the walls a little bit and have a, a simple color palette. Yeah, and I think that, to, sorry. No, yeah, no, and I think that um, we, we see a lot of current trends where uh, folks are putting um, really cool furniture in. Don't get me wrong. I mean, if I had um, a really deep resource bench and I could put in some pretty incredible collaborative tools, I, I would do that, but I think that there's so much you can do with intentionality without uh, that huge budget. Uh, you can see some of the things that manufacturers like Steelcase have and some other folks have that uh, it's really pretty impressive, but um, I, I do think that there are um, some other ways to look at that, Rebecca. Yeah, and um, it's funny because uh, Ben just asked if there was a classroom makeover crew, just like on TV, like on HGTV, and it's funny because that is something that um, every time we go in, people are like, that would be the best. I'd watch that HGTV show. But I mean, <laughs> that it's fun because when you go in, I work with, with teachers, that's kind of what it becomes. Um, everybody changes, their, their spaces change, they get re-energized. And looking at the image we have here, it's easy to think to do that with a big element. This, this is an expensive element, it's very beautiful, but if that's not what you need to make a collaborative environment. Um, a lot of times our collaborative environments are really created with the, like the interpersonal space, the trust that we foster with our students. And having um, some really simple furnishing can, can create that as well with like a, a simple table. It's not about the technology is not going to drive that collaborative environment always. So here's another one that um, these are very popular. The, the desks, these are steel case. There are other brands that make these as well. This is another one of our big trends in education. A lot of schools are just buying these and saying, we have collaborative, flexible furniture, we're done. And, you know, stamp, we're really proud of ourselves. And um, although there are, I think, around 300 um, per desk, that's not an out-of-control price. The thing is, we're still restricting students to desks. We're still saying there's one size fits all. And that's where um, I think Bob and I were really concerned with uh, this, this idea that it's going to be the furniture solution. And, it, it's not a one-size-fits-all. You're, what you're doing now, usually with this, is that the teacher is in control because they're saying, okay, break into these groups, break into that group, now full circle, which works for certain kinds of learning, but it doesn't work for everyone. So I think that 
before anybody purchases these kinds of desks or thinks about to create an environment with one kind of furniture, they need to really focus on what they want to have happen in the space. Yeah, I, I think that, that, that gets us to a, a point here of when we're starting this process, really deeply having this idea of, you know, student agency, teacher agency, really embedded deeply in all of the conversations. So stepping back from what are we going to put into the room to why are we going to put things in the room, and really thinking about that shift from a teacher-focused classroom to a student-focused classroom. Because what we know is that learning space design enhances great teaching and makes mediocre, okay, average teaching more difficult because oftentimes that's a teacher-focused space. And as we make that shift to a more student-focused space, it asks questions about classroom management. It asks questions about how do we group kids, how do we have routines and procedures. And so it really is a matter of why are we doing this because if you don't have that firm when all the rest of the messiness starts to happen um, you're going to be on kind of wobbly ground so we really encourage folks to focus on the why around this yeah and 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 that with a student and teacher agency um, this is something this is a question that i asked recently when i was working with a school in newport beach california that I, we went through maybe 10 or 12 questions with the students. I was about 45 minutes, and our administrators, they're amazingly beautiful people, were there. And we brought in different, different students and asked them where they learned best, what they like to learn, and we, how they feel at the end of the day. Um, what, if they could be anywhere to read, where would they go? And these are the kind of questions that start to really give us great ideas about what is driving our students, and that helps us to understand how to create an environment that will drive their learning. So at the very end, I always ask what questions should I have asked that I did not, because I'm always leaving something out. We always are. And that's, I think, a question to pose to all kids in, in their agency. And just the other day, I had a student say, I don't want to sit there. And so I said, great, thank you. And I went to all my classes and said, I am sorry. I failed you guys by saying, you have a choice where you sit. If it's not working for you, please come to me. You have to foster that trust first. So we. As part of creating student agency, we go and we ask questions. These are a bunch of designs from students that um, for a 21st century learning commons in their school, what they wanted. And of course, we have like soccer ball, soccer court areas, and giant slides. And we take this and really reflect on like, OK, we say we want a giant slide, but really we want something playful. So we maybe can't get the giant slide, but we want this space to feel playful. We want quiet corners because we need space to, to reflect. So we start with the group to dissect our thinking and really categorize what we want in our spaces so that our students can say we want spaces to play, we want spaces to reflect, we want spaces to build and create, we want spaces to collaborate. And then when we know that we want these spaces, this is what we want to have happen, then it's easier to choose what you're going to put in each space. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, in too many places, uh, who's making these decisions? Uh, an architect, um, possibly the maintenance director, uh, a custodian, uh, possibly uh, principals. And oftentimes what we find is the solution making that we're doing in those situations truly have nothing to do with what would enhance student learning and what really gets students excited about uh, going about their business in the classroom and really thinking in a deeper way. So um, I think we go out of our way to kind of really lean into this with a, a design mindset where uh, we're really asking kids and adults to really have empathy around what it means to have a classroom that supports learning. So our, our, our next thing is thinking about building um, your design mindset. And that's really the focus is that you, we, we had that question at the very beginning, what does each, um, who is the learning space designer, and then it's everyone in the room. So if you're going to build a design mindset, then you're going to start to really think about what you can do in the space. You're going to focus on the question we said before is, what do you want to have happen in your space? What will, what will a successful learning environment feel like? What will it look like? And with that, you start to categorize. You start with a very deep mission. So our next 
step with this is that we always go into our student voice, then that's when you're asking your question, your students, where do they feel empowered? Where do they want to learn? Um, what do they want to learn? And I wouldn't ever start any kind of a new space without first talking to students. How are you about that, Bob? Yeah, and I, sorry, I had my button. I hit the wrong button. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I think that, you know, we can't stress this enough. One, there needs to be a deep intentionality around being a brain-friendly classroom. Two, there has to be a deep focus about why are we doing this? Why are we doing this for student learning and shifting learning? And then as you begin to lean into this, we can't have students involved in the process enough from the beginning to the middle to the end. It's so important uh, because we are, and we know this, I mean, we have faculty meetings where we make decisions about how we're going to do things to kids every day. We have team meetings where we talk about that. And rarely is there a student voice. And if there is, it's often a token student voice where you bring one student into a committee or two students in the committee. Um, love the idea of students being deeply involved in democratizing what happens in the school. And that's not nothing different when it comes to learning spaces. We need to have students really, really uh, entrenched in being able to give us ideas, being right there deeply thinking about the design, and you know, really, really um, deeply embedded in figuring out uh, the solution and to be able to push back on the adults and say, no, that's not what we want. We are looking at a different way of doing this. And so I, I think that um, we can't stress that enough because I do think that's the big deficit in this work right now. Yeah, and so um, I, when, I, when we go in, we first talk to students about, we do a big brainstorm session. And that's kind of what you saw before with some of my, um, those, are my those are my first grade students last year. And that goes into like, what do you want to learn this year? because we can always bring, the, bring that in at any moment. So how do, you, how do you learn best? Where do you want to learn? And then um, we make designs. We start to, we start, I start to show them from their thinking how we can make this better. And here we've got a group of students that are, are doing that first brainstorming activity. That's with Gulliver where I am now. And then I take whatever they've written. We do a visual design process as well. They start to show me pictures and ideas of spaces that they love. And then we go through, we, we analyze that, and then we start to find furniture and things that work for that. And we're always going back to how does it, how does it make, how does it work in the space? Now this again is, can be for $500, it can be for $30,000. I've done classrooms that we completely renovate for $2,000, and some that are $30,000 depending on the budget. And I think most, the, really the creative fun is when you're digging through, as Bob and I have done in Afton, digging through rooms and storage and repurposing furniture and figuring out this could really work well because your purpose is very clear in what you want to have happen for in your space. Yeah, and I think it's worth noting here, Rebecca, that each space is different. And so uh, too often we see very cookie cutter changes happening in learning space design. There's a whole hallway worth of classrooms and they say, well, we're going to redo these. We're going to have more writable spaces. We're going to have more desks and, or more tables instead of desks. Instead of really thinking like, you know, social studies rooms are different than English rooms, and English rooms are different than science rooms, and a fifth grade class is different than a first grade class. So I do think that as we think about this, it really has to be personalized and individualized to the space that actually exists, because we know not all classrooms are the same size. Um, heck, with the size of the building that the classroom's on makes a difference. And so I think all of those things need to be considered because it can't be we're going to redo five spaces. Uh, we're going to redo five different spaces, five different ways with five different processes is probably the right way to go. Yeah, and, you, and, you, and you're thinking the entire time about like what actions are going to be happening in this space. So right now I'm working in a very active learning space. It's the science classroom, but it has to facilitate both fourth graders and kindergartners. And they are ergonomically completely different creatures. So we are coming up with ways that are that would support both styles, both kinds of learners, and creating an environment. You'll see a picture of this space a little bit later. But it's very different because I'm not putting in a lot of soft furnishings or big comfortable spaces because we're doing experiments. We're creating. A maker space will look very different than a learning commons or a reading room. 
And so that's what's so scary to me when people are like, oh, a furniture company comes in, like buy this chair, this is the most flexible chair. It's really not. Um, we, if we think about our homes, you would, never, you would never buy a bed and go, oh, best bed ever, great, I'm going to put one in the living room, I'm going to put one in the kitchen, I'm going to put one in the dining room. We, every, every element is going to support a different behavior. Even though so I'd, love to have con- a bed, I'd love to have a bed in my living room, though. That sounds like a real Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get a chaise, Bob. Um, right. it's, it's, really, it's really, really fun um, when, you, when you pull back and you, you think about that and laugh, and then you look at a classroom full of desks. It just doesn't make any sense. And so here, um, yeah. this is, yeah. do you want to talk about this one, Bob? No, yeah, I was just going to say, like, these are all different spaces, and they had different solutions. I mean, this was a library that had this beautiful skylight that really needed something to draw folks into the center of it with learning. And uh, Rebecca designed with students this great, uh, really, piece of art that sits in the middle of uh, this library. And it really became the centerpiece to say, you know, how wonderful is it that learning happens in this library in a new and fresh way? Uh, the librarian, the teachers, the students all wanted something to be a little bit different. And uh, it was fantastic just to start to see um, how a, one thing could really change the culture in that space. Yeah, and that's actually, it's fun because when I've worked with groups of teachers that are trying to create a collaborative space for themselves, they're always like, oh, tell us what we should buy. And I would always say, okay, do this. Find the, and this is the design term, you know, um, IDEO and different designers use this, is find your analogous situation. So go different places, see where it is that is supporting that kind of behavior, and then look around you and what, what are the physical elements. So this, for example, this space is in a fifth grade classroom, and the walls aren't finished yet. This, we just got the furniture in. This everything still has to be painted. It's missing its details, and I can't wait to see it when it's all finished. But they needed a space to convene as a group and or for smaller groups. So this space supported that because it was comfortable. It was also space to create a quiet area for students to get to read in. And uh, I think Peggy had a great question earlier about how you create a quiet space within a very busy environment. That's something I really struggle with. And because I have my quiet limit, my learners who really suffer in a loud space. What I've done in the past is we, we have a few moments of quiet where I'll put on a quiet song or we, we're, we're in silence and, we're, and I'll just stand in the class and say, we need to do this. We have, we have to respect all of our learners. We need three minutes of quiet and I'll put on um, some classical music and, and everyone will just work quietly. I would love to find that sound booth that you can or, or allow my kindergartners or first graders to go to a garden that I could still see them in that they could have that moment to relax. I don't know, Bob, if you found any solutions for our loud, our loud environments and to, to create our quiet spaces. Yeah, you know, our friend Pernille Rip uh, talks about how she starts her seventh grade classes with five minutes of just quiet and how it sets the tone and how these middle school students start to crave that quiet. And so, so amazing that she's able to pull that off. And we just don't think, like, you know, what that five minutes of peace and quiet and reflection in a really, really noisy world can do to kind of set the tone for kids. And so, you know, we would encourage folks to say, you know, how can we find little pockets of our world that can really support our students that need that? Uh, if anybody's read Susan Cain's book on quiet, it was really an eye-opener for me about how we need to better support our introverts in schools and how really introversion isn't a, you know, a trait that people are just saying, hey, I really, really need that and, you know, and what's going on. And, you know, one of our favorite things uh, that we've uh, put into action are these T-walls that are here. Uh, we've seen teachers use these as ways to support ideas, but also to create little niches in their classroom where students can hide, uh, get their ideas up, work behind, and they're on wheels. And so uh, they're a pretty fabulous sort of thing. One of the things we did with these slides, and uh, we would encourage you to go to the live binder and take a look at them, is just put in a number of really different pictures from places that we've worked or observed to give you some ideas. Um, I think, you know, we could spend hours just going through awesome pictures of learning spaces because there are so many great ones out there. Um, but, you know, I think that, um, so we encourage you to go look at those. So 
I think that um, what's been fun with learning spaces that's very different than um, a home kind of design or an office design is that we're really there to, like this says, celebrate the process of learning. And it's never, it's never about that product but it's how we learn and creating showcase walls, creating walls that are showing everyone, well, this is how I process information. This is my three-dimensional model. This is my 2D idea. And sharing how we think, that could be with, with sketches, with note-taking. We get to see how everyone else learns and how we're all so unique in that. And I think that when your classroom becomes a space that celebrates the process, it, start, it opens up everyone's eyes to see how they learn individually and how they can learn from others. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that I was talking to a high school teacher about the other day, and I think this is really important, that uh, this, this high school teacher had four sections of the same class. I think it was civics or American history. And I said, well, how does first hour and all the awesome stuff in first hour impact the learning that happens in third hour? Or are they starting all over again? Is there a way to get the thinking from first hour up on the wall somewhere so that their learning process can then impact third hour and we can build a cycle of feedback where all of the students are feeding each other's learning? We talk about breaking down silos so often, and what we never hardly allow is that interplay between classes at the secondary level. Uh, you know, I know a number of middle school science teachers that are trying to figure out how not only to use Google Docs, but to use all of their learning space as a way to not only celebrate process, but use the learning process to enhance everyone else that they see and visit and facilitate learning for every day. And, you know, I, I think it's a really big step forward to think that our learning spaces could really, really um, unpack learning in a more efficient and effective way if we allowed for that to happen. You know, I, I love things like this that are. Um, hey, this is our messy bulletin board that shows where we messed up, that shows where we made mistakes, that shows how we went from part A to point B in the writing process and we went back to part A before we went to part C. Uh, too often we have bulletin boards with a bunch of papers that say 100% and have a gold star on them. And that doesn't do anything for the learners that are struggling, nor does it do anything to help folks realize that process sometimes outweighs product. And I think we have to visually display that we um, want to celebrate um, failure, if you would. We want to celebrate process. We want to celebrate the messiness that is learning. So it's fun because after I had that conversation with Bob about the asynchronous learning, I teach three sections of science. And um, we're, my, my classroom is very inquiry-based. And so uh, we're in Miami. And we're, we're supposed to be learning about water. And I said, okay, but what do you really care about? Like, what is, what's interesting to you about water? And the kids had no idea that canals were man-made. And we're living in, you know, basically on a swamp that's been entirely man-made. And that's their home. So I said, great. Like, and I have, a, I have a piece of paper up. Like, what do you want to learn about? And we add to it constantly. And so, you know, kids in one class are, are fueling the ideas of everyone else. And so next week, because of that idea, and because one class had that, that idea, that inquiry, and it built on another classes, and we're all kind of working together asynchronously, we're going to um, create swamps and buckets and then build up canals so we can see how they're built. We're building them ourselves. So that idea that we're all in it together and that their ideas are up on the wall is, is, is really exciting because then they talk about it in the hallways. That was a great, a great thing from Bob. Yeah, and you know, the shift for me, and you know, this is really a shift in all of the things that are going on in education. First, you know, I, I do a lot of work around technology integration and really making that work meaningful. But I think our learning spaces fit into this as well. Um, you know, our learning spaces in the past have been places where kids came to consume information. Teachers talked, kids consumed, they locked out the door when the bell rang, and they went and consumed some more information somewhere else. And just as technology can be a consumption device, the real shift and the real power and the real beauty of that comes when it becomes a device that can help students to create and make and design. And we believe that learning spaces are the same. That learning spaces, when you go from a consumption model to one where kids are creating and making and designing, you're starting to unlock the power of learning that we've known for a long time. Now, this isn't 
new pedagogy. This is amplifying good pedagogy with learning spaces, with technology, with whatever else you're going to wrap around really good teaching and learning. And, you know, we just really deeply believe that learning spaces are one of the big levers that we have left in really getting more kids engaged and excited about their work. Yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing because from that I was reading, Ben had um, talked about having augmented reality. And I've seen, it's great, my son's kindergarten class, they, um, what they'll do is they, well, they use different, they use different techniques, but we'll see a finished drawing. And then there will be a QR code or um, a quiver, and you'll scan it, and then you'll see the kid, like the students drawing, and then usually talking about it at the same time, how it feels. So you, you we get to really pull in, in that digital environment and get a deeper story than you can get um, just in a 2D, you know, on, on the wall. So I think that's a really great point that we're sharing that journey and the finished product. Yeah, you know, uh, Rebecca and I had a chance. This is another angle of that same room we saw at the beginning. Uh, but really, there was a focus that we were creating a space for kids to come and design. And one of the things we saw was that students did, but also the adults did. So there's value in taking adult learning spaces as well. PD rooms, library conference rooms, teachers' lounges, and really shifting their purpose. And we're seeing this more and more as a way to kind of showcase what's possible in the classroom. And so we would encourage you to not only think about learning spaces for the kids, but what learning spaces do you have for adults that could also make this shift? I think that's a really, really important piece of the puzzle here. Yeah, and, and, that's, you know, and that's the... Yeah, go ahead, sorry. That's that said, great the movement right now about Starbucks My Classroom. I think it's it's really fun because it's recognizing that there's that we have we want to have a lot of different seating options for kids, and that when I go into Starbucks, depending on where I'm going to work or whatever coffee shop, if I'm going to work there, I'm going to probably go to a high top table and sit in a stool and I like to kind of like look out over everything. If I'm going to be like having a conversation with a friend, we tend to gravitate toward the club chairs and like near, nearer to a fire to kind of a bonfire source. I think beginning to be observant and conscious of those things is, is a great way to move forward into creating designed environments, but also pulling back and thinking that it's, there's not going to be a one size fits all. A math classroom, like Bob said earlier, will look dra dramatically different than a classroom where students are all day. And if they're going to come in for 30 minutes and you're going to expect them to do something, like in this class here, this is really fun. This is like a 10-minute design um, uh, right before I, I, I moved to Miami uh, in Afton where this is a drama classroom and they had a bunch of weird desks that the, but the students instead, they're supposed to be creating plays, writing plays, acting. And so we're like, well, why does the desk doesn't make sense? This should be a very active environment. You need something that's going to facilitate a different kind of posture than leaning back and sitting in a desk and, and receiving information. So we chose these little red um, red stools. And these, I think, are two for $50. They didn't hold up so well because they, I think that they were a little bit um, maltreated. But they are also the elements for the stage. So they can be put together, and they can be um, a table and two chairs for a play. They can be a bed. They can be a sofa. So what is the element in the classroom becomes the same thing for the stage area. So we're, we're, we're always really thinking, as your designer in your space, what do I need to support the activities of my kids? What are the activities? What will support that? And it's not furniture focused. And if anybody walks through with anything that they, they're no, they don't start looking through catalogs, they start really looking at their students and really looking at what they want their students to be doing. And then the stuff will follow. Yeah, and, and I, I do want to caution that, you know, um, there are lots of classrooms that really look like an episode of Hoarders. Um, you know, you walk into a space <laughs> where there was a teacher that's been there for 35 years, and in year two, she told someone that she liked frogs. And we know what happens, right? Like, everyone gives you a frog on every, on your birthday, on Christmas, on every holiday. And so the classroom becomes consumed with stuff. And we want to make sure that this isn't about the stuff, just like Rebecca said, and that oftentimes the best thing you can do is take things out, remove things from this space. And this classroom right here was a good example of that. This was chock full of stuff. And when you do find stuff, I would encourage you not to just bring a hodgepodge of things. Someone said the other day, we do not want to have classrooms that look like an episode of Sanford and Sons. 
And I thought that was really fitting, that we don't want this to look like a room with a whole bunch of one-off pieces of furniture that looks like a junk store. But we really want to be intentional about all of those pieces of the puzzle. And intentional about other things, too. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, we don't have as much control over things like light and sound and color. Not all of us can paint our classrooms. Not all of us can, you know, uh, put a blanket on top of the AC unit that's outside of our window. Uh, sometimes we can't fix the fluorescent lights, but we do think that there are some ways to hack all of those things. Uh, some ideas there, Rebecca? Yeah, so this, this is a little space. Um, there was, it was basically like a tiny little corner classroom. This is a collaborative environment. I know that since then, Valerie's kind of expanded her space. So what we did, and she didn't have a lot of choices, and this is a tiny, tiny classroom where like maybe five kids would go in at one time. But when you, for color, when you reduce your palette, and you say, for, in this space, I said, okay, just greens and whites and grays. And that's it. And there can be a variety of greens, but it gives the idea of some color. And again, this is a very low budget room. You can see IKEA tables are recycled chairs from another classroom. But when you do this, you create a sense of unity in the space. And she was lucky enough to have a, um, a window right there that did bring in some natural light. We put the curtains in front of it so that it would kind of, it would, it would catch the light and glow as, as a lighting element would as well. So in the next page, um, this is my current classroom. And we're still kind of in, 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 a, in a change phase with this. But I had two tiny little hallway, um, I have two tiny little hallway windows. So we added in really inexpensive lamps. And then we, had, we already had this green uh, leaf. So we, we put it that way, and it's illuminated from within. We're going to put plants and all sorts of animals along the back of the science and STEM classroom. And then we pushed the tables around. We covered up with a plastic um, fabric from IKEA underneath all of these. This used to be a computer lab which stores all of our stuff. So you, the eye doesn't get caught on a bunch of stuff. And you can see my learning wall before it really is it's kind of exploded now. It's just some, some magnetic boards that as our learning changes, we put the information up there. So we kind of created a sense of unity again with color palette. On a dark wall, we added in lamps. And this is all, this is like $700, which seems like a lot, but we really, you know, we changed from what it was. And it, and it can completely change the way the environment is just thinking about adding light in dark spots and creating a sense of unity with color. Yeah, and we get, we get asked a lot about, okay, we're a very technology-rich school. What's this mean for us, and how do we make this work? Uh, and we've seen some solutions here. Um, we see uh, classrooms that exist at a place like Epic Elementary School in Liberty, Missouri, where they have uh, iPads for all their students. There are 50 students in the room. There's two teachers, it's project-based learning, and the learning space there is big and open and really gives kids an opportunity to create and make and design. And so it's a really nice thing, but certainly we want to move away from things that are static. Anytime that we can move from kids sitting in a static space using technology, um, we would like to do that. And, you know, you see things like this where kids can plug in and collaborate. Uh, we were able to turn a conference room into a collaboration space for students where they can look and work together on things like this. And then we also love these creation studios where we have young people that are filming and creating. They're you know, doing the morning newscast. They're really being thoughtful about how video creation happens. We have so many kids that consume video and watch YouTube video after YouTube video. But really being an academic consumer of video comes oftentimes from when you create your own video and knowing the art that goes into shooting, editing, refining, thinking about all the details that come along with those sort of things. So we think that technology done right can play a vital role in some of these learning spaces for sure. So I think what's, what's so funny is that um, budget means very different things to different people. And I think that there's a great breakdown when you're going to do redo a space. What happens often is that you get maybe a bond, a bond measure passed, or some, you, have, you suddenly have this windfall of money, and the idea is to spend it right away. Um, or you have nothing. But there's a way to really do this intentionally. Bob, do you want to talk about this with the breakdown? Yeah, and you know, you know, we've certainly tested this in a few places, but we think this is a, a, a good framework to, to build around. Is that when you have a budget to redesign a learning space, whatever that is, 
really, how can you think about spending the first 30% of that money to buy a few things to let kids interact with them, um, to let kids start to be able to manipulate them and see how they work for them, and making that a part of the very beginning process where you're asking students questions and you're getting students involved, and you're like, okay, let's try a few things out. And then you can kind of be an anthropologist of your space. You can really watch and see what's used and what isn't used. The problem is we oftentimes buy 100% and 40 or 30% of it is never used because kids never wanted it. And so we have to really think about how can we do that in a 30% phase, really understand what kids want and need, buy another 40%. And by that time, maybe you're 18 months into the process and you really know what's good. And now you can use a little bit of money that's left to supplement as things evolve in the classroom. Oh, we do need a little more storage. Oh, we are going to need some things to do that with because our class and our learnings evolved and you have a little bit of pot of money left to do something with. So I don't know if those are perfect percentages, but there's certainly a way of thinking about spending a budget when it comes to learning space. Beginning phase, really an investigation, that middle phase that gets you pretty close to where you want to be, and then kind of a reinforcement enrichment phase where you're able to bring some of those final touches into the classroom. Rebecca, you uh, want to talk about this case study a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Grandview Prep is in Boca Raton, Florida, and I got, they're a really dynamic independent school, and they, I went in for a day, and we can show the, uh, where's our next slide? We can show, this is the before picture. So this is an art space. Um, it's a really big, beautiful room. Uh, obviously, you can see it's very creative and, and <laughs> an active space. And they wanted to turn it into um, sort of more of a 21st century learning commons. And the idea is an international design room. And they might be doing anything could happen in this space, presentations, creation. So um, I went in for a day to help them figure some things out. And they had, um, they had a, a, obviously, a very small budget relatively. And did a, we, I think we did a really beautiful um, beautiful job with it. So this is another angle of the of the image of the space. So we cleaned everything out, and uh, I'll do the first one. Oh, and so when we when we first talked about doing the space, I apologize. Here's a picture of it. We wanted to create a space that students could be brainstorming in. There could be collaboration. We all the furniture could change to become a presentation space. They wanted it to feel like home. So we did about an hour and a half because they, they, they started off like everybody does and they turned and like opened up catalogs and said, what should we buy? And we really did that deep thinking of what do we want to have happen in space? What is our aesthetic as a school? And we, um, we realized that we needed to redo the floors because there was a big hole in it. So we picked flooring and an aesthetic. We, the ceiling was very low, so we painted it black. And that kind of gives you that night sky. It feels much more open now, surprisingly. And we just chose a simple limited palette that was the school's palette for, um, for the rest of the school. And now everything in the space can change and move. And we did a big farmhouse table because this is a very small school that um, is very community and very family oriented. And so a, like having a space that the entire class could gather around of 12 students felt really right to, the, to their administrators. And you can see we're still building our screws up and drills around. Um, but that was, that was just, it was really fun to see, and this we I met with them in June, and these are the pictures of a couple weeks ago. We're still missing some things, so they wanted to have a kitchen because this also might be a reception area. So they we put in a little kitchen in that blackboard area where students are going to design and change. Um, we the whole space was including flooring and kitchen and um, paint and everything included was less than ten thousand, and so and all furniture. So all furniture actually came from IKEA and. Parents came in and helped build it, and they were, they were. This is a really big community space now. They're really happy. The um, some of the seniors asked if because this is a pre-K through 12 uh, school, they've asked if they can move in or take elements to their dorms next year. So this is a lower collaborative area. We've got our little tables that are rewritable. Um, that then we can move away. So when we're doing presentations. We have the TED, uh, the IKEA TED rug. So when they're doing presentations, they can stand on that. And then we have um, another collaborative area over. We've got different kinds of seating. And everything can move through the space. And as I was setting this up with them, because I went for a day to help them kind of move and set things up, I kept not answering questions. 
because the most important thing is that the people in the space feel ownership. So what you have to understand what's going to work for you. Your students need to understand. So we did an initial setup, but it should not look the same way it does today that it will in six months. It should change almost weekly and daily depending on the learning and the collaboration that's going to happen in that space. I think always keeping your spaces in beta and always being aware that and being an anthropologist, like Bob said, looking at your spaces really thoughtfully and saying, wow, this isn't supporting learning. How can I change that is important. You don't ever just redesign a classroom and that's it and you're done. Yeah, uh, the redesign of the learning space is not a checklist. It's not a to-do thing like, okay, I redesigned my learning space. Check. I'm moving on to the next thing that I need to learn and do. It really is a mindset. It's a way of life. It's about thinking like a designer. It's about making students center. And it really is about walking in on a yearly basis, on a monthly basis, and saying, what are we learning differently than we were a month ago? And how should this space look different if we're learning things that are different? Um, just really excited because we're seeing a lot of really positive things happen around the country in this regard. A lot of great conversations, a lot of folks that have picked up the book and said, wow, this has really sparked my way of thinking. You know, about half the nation is back to school now, and about half the nation is still setting up classrooms to return uh, here after Labor Day. So there's still a lot of time for folks to really rethink things and to begin to take some small steps, I think, that really um, can make a big difference in the way that learning is happening. Uh, it's been great to be here. Uh, any final thoughts, Rebecca, before we jump to questions? Um, no, let's just jump to questions. Awesome. I was capturing questions as we went along, and some of them have already been answered. Do you start your co-designing with empty walls and no organization with your furniture and equipment, or does it matter? Uh, so my my that thought around that, yeah my, yeah, my quick version of that is I think a blank slate can be pretty overwhelming. So I, I don't mm -hmm. call for the blank slate. Uh, I, I, I call for a little bit different uh, piece of the puzzle there. So uh, I'll give Rebecca some space on that one. Okay. Um, I think no one really has a blank slate. It's usually we've all been in classrooms. So they have a reference point and they have a good reference point of where they learn. Questions I ask is if you're in your home, where would you rather be is a great question. Um, that gives us ideas. So where would you rather be? You usually already have classroom furniture or students have been in them. So instead I'd say what do you want to have happen in the space? Where would you rather be? What do you want to create? Um, what spaces excite you? Have them show you spaces. Then from that, you can kind of take everything and start to categorize what it needs to happen in the space. You also have to think about your whole group instruction, um, what's going to support facilitating the learning in the space and balance the things out. You might find one year that you have a lot of students who really need to get in the corners and be quiet. And that is true when you have that flexible furniture, you can do that. But I think all, flex all furniture can be flexible. Um, it's really about you thinking how the body of the student can be the most flexible. Because you can get throw a pillow and a rug against the floor, and that's a cozy, comfy, hidey space. So it doesn't have to be something purchased. You think about what's going to support that student's action. Yeah, I saw, I saw that uh, Radney asked a question about um, very small spaces that are, you, know, you can get a whole bunch of kids in. Um, a couple of thoughts there. One, um, we as educators don't do a very good job of using things like the hallway and extending our classrooms beyond the door we have. So I've seen some success where folks have been able to extend their classroom out into the hallway space for learning. Another way, the, you know, we showed that classroom there that was a drama classroom. That's a pretty small space. And we really did take almost everything out of it. Uh, but it really is a small space. And those, you know, classes of 20 plus that were uh, learning in that space. And so, um, oftentimes, the smaller the space, the less stuff that can be in there. Okay. Yeah. Is that, is that, are you answering the tiny tiny house design question, Bob? Is that what I, oh, I didn't did see I, that. No. No. Go ahead. Oh, I, I thought those were too connected. Um, Rodney asked, "How would you apply ideas from tiny house design?" I think um, I just I have we have two classes like that now that I helped redesign at Gulliver, and really quickly the 
we, I think making, having um, shared tables that come out like peninsulas from the wall helps give you some more floor space. Anytime you can have something that's nesting uh, helps that you are able to kind of to, to move things and, and have them change, but definitely the peninsula idea has been the only thing that's really worked for us. You don't want a lot of floating elements because the space feels really crowded really quickly. As, as many things that can kind of be fixed and have your students be that flexible element that then, um, and things a little bit higher usually helps that space as well. So if you could get like bar height stools depending on the age of the students. And like Bob said, if they can, if you can trust them out in the hallway or there's a space to kind of explode in or there are times in which we do a certain activity and we all go to the library and you can get out of that space. I think that um, we get so locked into those walls and our learning can really sometimes happen anywhere in the school. Yeah, and I would just, as a final note, it just, um, you know, Rebecca and I have really enjoyed being a part of a whole bunch of different schools process uh, when it comes to learning space, whether it's just sharing ideas with a school leader. Uh, yesterday I had an opportunity to work and talk with somebody in Jonesboro, Arkansas, who was just looking for some ideas. Um, you know, he had saw the book, he had read the book and said, I really had an idea. What do you think about this? I think both of us really enjoy having those conversations, whether they're, you know, a Twitter conversation, a phone call, or sitting down face to face and really digging in and doing you know, multiple day sessions on site with folks. It, it really has been um, a, a lot of a lot of fun. I've got another question here. What tools do you use to render your 3D space designs? So um, I don't. I never do. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I do. I don't. So I always really start off, and I, I know this kind of um, can be seem strange to some people, but I always start off with um, having having teachers and students. We're going to create like a, a, a mood board. So ideas of what we like, and it's how it's going to function. Sometimes it's color. Sometimes it's aesthetic. And once you really have that, you've got your mission of what you want the space to be. Then I would um, educators can get a version of Autodesk for free. It's really quite simple. Um, so I have that on my computer and I will, I, I do everything in 2D and a lot, if you're buying from certain furniture providers, they give you 2D CAD models that you can just pop in and move them around. Um, I have done three dimensional renderings. I did that for eight years. Mm -hmm. I don't find it's worth the time for a space. I find that when you can show images of the spaces, the kind of spaces you want to create, you want to create, and then it's a simple 2D top down technical drawing, that, that really renders the idea of what, what's going to happen in the space. The way in which um, a three-dimensional, like, professional rendering uh, would take hours, and I don't, I don't think it's worth the time. Okay. And one last new question that I saw. Do you have a network or learning sharing group organized around your book? Well, we are. We will be launching um, an online course uh, where mm -hmm. folks can get in. It's like a two-week course, so it's kind of a fast and furious two weeks, but really gives folks an opportunity to interact, uh, pick up a number of new resources, get a chance to talk with us, and then actually get down to the business of actually starting to do some of this. So uh, we'll be launching that sometime in the fall, and we're excited to uh, kind of lean into that new venture here real soon. That's great. And we have. We have a Twitter chat going on with um, a tech team all next month. That is going to be really fun. So a great thing to do is to follow us on Twitter and follow a tech team because uh, we'll be hopefully maybe developing more communities with them around, uh, around learning space design. Terrific. Those were the questions that I found and the ones that came in as I was asking. I'm going to turn the uh, program over to Peggy now who will introduce what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Bob and Rebecca. You have gotten our minds really spinning now, so we have lots of things to explore after this webinar is over. And we would like to invite all of you to come back and join us again for one of our future shows. They are all recorded, so if you can't make it on a Saturday, you know that you can always go back to our blog later and watch the recording. We won't be having a show next weekend because it's later 
Labor Day weekend. And there's also an incredible EduPassions free virtual conference going on that day. So look for that if you're looking for something fun to do. On September 10th, Heidi Samuelson is going to be joining us and talking all about classroom resources to enhance the use of technology. It's a fantastic presentation. And on September 17th, Laura Krenicki is has a great show planned for us on global literacy and geography resources. And you can imagine many of them might be coming from Google. September 24th, we have a super show with Mike Murata, who's going to be sharing assistive technology for struggling readers. And that means all kinds of students, anyone who may be a struggling reader, not just special needs students. And October 1st, we are looking forward to having Karen Lerman and Kristen Mydeen join us to talk about innovating with the iPad a perfect follow-up for today's show. So thanks to all of you for joining us. And we'll just wrap up and say have a great weekend. Steve Hargadon's latest project is the Learning Revolution Project. He's get, gathered all his PD in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session like this one. And as long as your session is public, it's free. As you exit, the survey should open in your browser. If not, you can take the link from the chat. Or inside the live binder, you can also get the link for the survey. In that survey, you can request a professional development certificate. And thanks to Patty Ruffing, she's the one who sends these out. They also now print with your name. Make sure you use a personal email for this request, not a school email. Schools tend to block this from getting to you. Special thanks to our special guests, Dr. Robert Dillon and Rebecca Hare, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show. Thanks so much for coming.